What's up and welcome back to another live stream with Gizmo Slip Tech. Today, we are gonna be doing an unboxing re review of the MSI Pulse 15. Now this is gonna be one of the best mid-range, more budgety options, but not really super budget because you know it's 1500 bucks. Um, so you're getting a bit more premium of display on this. It's gonna be a QHD 165 Hertz, supposed to be, I think, fairly bright and fairly vibrant, but we're gonna actually gonna test that today with the display testing tool that I have, uh, Spider 5 Elite. We're also gonna be unboxing the bottom, removing the bottom, seeing what the inside looks like, seeing what the upgradability is like. We're gonna play a bunch of games on this guy. And then we are going to uh, test the speakers, test the keyboard, the trackpad, the webcam. Uh, we're gonna look at the ports. We're gonna look at every single thing you can possibly look at about this laptop in detail. Uh, for the most part, I think this is gonna be one of the top picks if you're looking at a $1,500 price point for a gaming laptop, there are gonna be some other options out there and we're gonna go over all of those options. And as a matter of fact, we're gonna do, a, do that right now um, before we continue. So 2023 gaming laptop rank list. Now there are going to be a lot of laptops going in and out of this top deals section right now. Uh, they're the start right now. The starting price is at 1349, but we'll have some other cheaper laptops in that top deal section, uh, very soon. As a matter of fact, I think this Acer Nitro five probably deserves to be in there. It's, it's a really nice deal. Um, overall the one I just recently tested, I liked it a lot. Um, but yeah, anyway, just know that if you're looking for a great deal on a laptop, you can look in this top deal section and likely find a really good deal in your price range. And we're going to go over some of the best deals at the $1,500 price point, uh, that we're going to be competing that are going to compete really well against this pulse 15. So, um, anyway, on this, on this sheet, just so you know how it works, you, there's a link in the description down below if you want to check it out. Uh, if you click this expansion button or if you're on mobile, you can tap on the laptop name. It'll pop up with a card view and you can see pictures of the laptop. This will let you see what ports are on it. You can also look in the top right up here. There are uh, specs for the CPU, the GPU, how much RAM it has, the SSD space, the display, and hopefully a little bit about the quality of the display if we have that information. Now, uh, in addition, we have the price point. Uh, the total size, the battery size, and then there's links at the bottom for each laptop where you can buy it if it's available for sale. And we update this list uh, with all of these laptops uh, and their pricing, whether they're available in stock or sold out or what, what sales are going on across tons of different websites every single day. So just know that if you're looking for up-to-date information on which laptops are available, which laptops are not available, if you're not sure if some laptop you're interested in is available, you can check the list and see stock and availability as well as find benchmark information. If you go over to the, further to the right, we do have a lot of benchmark data here now for the Time Spy and Cinebench R23. Um, and we are also adding in God of War, Red Dead Redemption, and Cyberpunk benchmarks. I think we're gonna change up which games we're gonna be adding here, but as I do the benchmarks, we're adding them to the list. And I've done now 15, 16 different laptops, and we're gonna keep going through more and more laptops and keep adding more and more data to the list here. So, and you can see some of these left, there's a lot more data down here. Um, and we are looking around the internet for more data as well. Uh, and we link to the benchmark sources. So if you wanna know where we found these benchmarks, you can find potential reviews of these laptops for any benchmarks you do see on the sheet. So just know there's a benchmark sources here as well. Um, and yeah, and the, on the left side, you can also filter and sort this list. So if you're a price range is up to $1,500, you can set the price range to be up to $1,500 or 1200 to 1500 whatever you want, or display size or weight or whatever. So there's a lot of, a lot of power, a lot of availability to take advantage of on this sheet. Uh, and I would encourage you to do so. The, the sheet now has 85,000 views. Moving on to our uh, first up, our comparisons, all right? So MSI Pulse 15, we got an i7 13620H with an RTX 4060. It's rated to 140 watts. I'm gonna be looking for 140 watts uh, when we're playing games and doing our benchmarks test, but I don't know that we'll actually see that. We'll see. Um, I haven't done any tests on it yet, but so far, like I found out the Acer Nitro 5 that I reviewed was technically rated at 140 watts, but we never saw 140 watts in any game. Like it was literally like, 
what, 105, 110 watts was the most we saw. So I don't know if we're actually going to see 140 watts right now in this laptop, but either way, we'll still be evaluating performance, and hopefully we're going to get a high enough TDP to have great performance from the RTX 4060. Now, this comes with 16 gigs of DDR5 5200. I, uh, that's DDR5, so it's going to be dual channel no matter what. A uh, one terabyte SSD, so that's nice. You're getting an additional uh, larger SSD with the Pulse 15 compared to, I believe, the Katana. The Katana came with a one terabyte as well, but some of these uh, around $1,500, like this Zephyrus G16, it only has a 512 gig SSD, so um, you wouldn't necessarily have to upgrade the SSD as quickly if you get the Pulse 15. Uh, and then we have a QHD 165 hertz. This is supposed to be 100% DCI P3 color gamut display. And as you can see, it's a very similar build and design look for the Pulse 15 when you compare it to the Katana, though I don't believe it's the exact same one. There is some differences. We'll try to look for those differences as we do this unboxing. All right, so next up uh, that we're gonna be comparing with is the Zephyrus G16. Now this has the same CPU, the same GPU, um, but it only has 16 gigs of DDR4 3200, and this is in single channel memory wise, right? So you're gonna get more performance out of the Zephyrus G16 if you upgrade the RAM to dual channel. Um, so that's very important to note. The 16 gigs is soldered onto the motherboard, 512 gig SSD, so a smaller SSD. And then you only get a full HD plus 165 Hertz display and it's 284 nits as measured by my Spider 5 Elite. Now the Zephyrus G16, the thing about it is you do have Windows Hello, you have a nice speaker system on the G16, um, and it's just a bit more of a premium feel to the machine overall. And I do really recommend the Zephyrus G16, uh, but today, because you, you look at this, you also get a 16 by 10 aspect ratio with minimal bezel on it, but there's certain things you're not getting as high value as the Pulse 15. You have a smaller SSD, you have slower RAM, that's only single channel, and then you also only have a full HD display instead of a QHD display, and I believe the Pulse 15 display is gonna be brighter as well. So there's a lot of trade-offs between the Zephyrus G16 and the Pulse 15, and I'm thinking that if you're after a better quality display, the Pulse 15 is gonna be the way to go. Uh, but we'll have to see. We'll have to see by the end of today. I'm going to be doing a summary of everything we find out about the laptop at the end. So um, if you only have a little bit of time, I would recommend at least checking that part out as well. Uh, MSI 15, Katana 15, this is one I reviewed recently. Now this has a 12th gen 12650H, a very similar CPU to the one in the in this Katana uh, sorry, the, in the Pulse 15, you got an RTX 4070. It went up to about 105 watts, um, and you do eight get you get either eight or 16 gigs of DDR5 4000 series memory. Oh, depending on which one you end up getting, I believe is this the this is the new egg right here. So um, this is the one that I reviewed right here, uh, and it did come with 16 gigs of RAM. Uh, I don't. It's DDR5, so it's going to be single channel. Uh, it's going to be dual channel either way. But the display on this Katana is basically as cheap a display as you can possibly get. It's a very low color gamut and very low nits brightness. But at least you get a one terabyte SSD, um, and the performance on the 4070 was, I thought, pretty decent. Like it was, it was cranking out good frame rates. Um, and But the thing is, the display is really going to be a drawback and a hindrance to people who want a higher quality display. Now, the Katana 15 obviously is a very uh, thin, portable type of chassis. And I, I'm not saying uh, that you should necessarily buy the Katana 15. I think the Katana 15 is really more for the people that just want pure GPU performance and maybe they're going to use it on an external monitor mainly. That's the only situation where I think I'd probably recommend the Katana 15 over the Pulse 15 because displays are so important to having a great all-around um, experience with your gaming laptop. Now, uh, Len next we're going to talk about three laptops on sale. Lenovo Legion 5. This is one of the laptops on sale in the top deal section right here. Okay, so we're going to talk about three laptops right now in the top deal section um, the Lenovo Legion 5 Ryzen 7 6800 RTX 3070 Ti. Um, 140 watt, and it is 140 watt. It goes up to that high a wattage. Um, 16 gigs DDR5, two terabyte SSD. Phenomenal value on the SSD for the money at 1489. Uh, full HD 165 hertz display, and that that's the downside. You're paying 1500 essentially 1489 
for a, only a full HD display. Um, and then it's obviously going to be a larger, heavier system uh, when compared to something like the Pulse 15 or some of these other laptops like the Zephyrus G16, but you get a number pad on it. Um, so this one's on sale right now. There's a link again in the description to this deals list, uh, and you got links to buy on all of these laptops. Next up, we have the SCAR 15. I love the SCAR 15. I use this laptop for my own laptop for a long time. RTX 3080, 130 watt, 16 gigs DDR4 3200, a one terabyte SSD, a full HD 300 hertz display. That's a nicer quality display, but again, it's not QHD, but you get an RTX 3080, right? So you get 16 gigs of VRAM, which is gonna be awesome if you wanna do 4K gaming or just ensure that you're more future-proofed with your VRAM when compared to like the eight, gigs of VRAM on the Pulse 15. So that's one, uh, probably one of the major considerations. Plus you got a Ryzen chip in there. So the battery life is going to be pretty decent. Um, and the, so the SCAR, the SCAR 15, I think is a, an awesome laptop with good speakers, nice RGB. Um, and I, I can definitely recommend this at the $1,500 price point as well, but it is going to be again, a bit of a thicker system and a decent set of ports on this guy too. Not amazing ports, um, but, but pretty decent. Now the, this guy is a interesting option. The Acer Nitro five with an eight core Ryzen seven, 6,800 H RTX, RAR, RTX 3070 Ti up to 150 Watts. According to this 30, I don't, I haven't tested that, uh, RT, 32 gigs of DDR five, 32 gigs of DDR five. Is that a tight? There's that's impressive. Um, 32 gigs of DDR five. Uh, one terabyte SSD, QHD 165 hertz with a high color gamut is what it's supposed to be. Um, again, we haven't tested that, but these are the claims by the manufacturer for $1,349. I don't anticipate this deal to, to be up here for too long. It's $750 off. Um, so if you're looking for currently the best deal under $1,500, this is probably currently the best deal under $1,500 for right now. Probably better than the Pulse 15, though in frame generation games, the Pulse 15 will definitely crush this 3070 Ti in frame generation titles specifically. But in raw rasterization performance, this Nitro 5 should be better, right? Because it's got a 3070 Ti, um, at least by a bit. Um, and the display should be in the same ballpark of quality. But 32 gigs of RAM is a nice upgrade on this Nitro 5, especially considering the price point. And I'm sure this sale is only going to be temporary, not permanent. Again, this is a thicker, heavier system at 5.5 pounds and about an inch, 1.16 inches thick. So know that the Pulse 15 weighs five pounds, right? And it is also very thin, about uh, basically one inch thin um, overall for the chassis. All right, so those are the competition laptops that I would say are worth considering. Uh, on the outside, you can see we've got the MSI logo. We've got a bit of info about the laptop. Um, and then this box came shipped in another box if you buy this from Newegg. So it's very safe. Um, basically, it's a triple box system for the laptop. I like seeing that. Um, ooh, that was loud. Okay, so here's the uh, Pulse. Here's the Pulse 15 box in this box. Uh, is actually probably not quite as fancy as the Cyborg 15 box, uh, but I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm okay with a simple box solution as long as, uh, you know, I mean, it, at least it has a cool like printed design on it, right? So that's, that's good. So the laptop comes uh, wrapped in plastic. Now I did of course take this laptop out of the box yesterday when it came in the mail and installed all the drivers and up Windows updates and all of that. We have our power cable. And you can see it is also wrapped in plastic. Now it was wrapped in a tie. It had a, it had a little uh, metal tie on it. And I did actually wrap it up and put the tie on it, but apparently I didn't twist it enough times. So it came apart. <laughs> I try to make this look exactly as it was when I unboxed it, right? So the power cable itself is about six feet long for this side of the power cable, which is nice. We have our power adapter cable, or sorry, our power adapter. Uh, and this is a Ciccone 240 watt. You know already, this guy is gonna be able to supply the juice of a high TDP laptop compared to some of the other budget systems we've been testing, like the Cyborg 15 and 
the Gigabyte G5, those were only like 100, like 120, I think, watt power adapters or something, or 140 watt. They were very low wattage. So there's nothing else here. Uh, we just have our little manual with the quick start guide, which I'm gonna bust this open and so we can see inside. All right, so we got our quick guide. All right, so this just tells you what the ports are and what to do uh, for different LED statuses, uh, what type of port it is, USB 3.2, Gen 1, HDMI, all of that. Essentially, the only thing you really need to know about the laptop is make sure you plug it in before you start turning it on. They also have a helpline for MSI 188-447-6564. 24 hours a day, Monday through Friday. They are closed on weekends and holidays. Interesting that they're closed on weekends, so hopefully you don't break down at, uh, at a bad time. But at least, it's, at least it's like open 24 hours on the weekdays because a lot of support lines close, um, you know, after like 6 o'clock. All right, so um, thank you for supporting MSI. Scan and get benefits now. Scan for more details. Let's open this guy up, and I know there's a keyboard cover, so we're gonna take the keyboard cover off, and there's the keyboard itself. All right, so that's all of the materials that are worth unboxing. Nothing too special with the unbox. Nice and simple packaging overall. All right, so as you can see, this is a metal top lid. This is gonna be a little bit higher um, quality top lid than some of the more budgety laptops that are all plastic, so that's a nice texture and nice feeling, I guess gives you a little more premiumness than some of the competition laptops out there. Um, inside here, you can tell it is a plastic chassis and this keyboard is the exact same layout as the MSI GT77 Titan. So you get the same number pad layout, you get the same uh, arrow keys with a crosshair on the down arrow and max fan mode on the up arrow, pause and play on the left arrow, um, we're gonna go over, over all, we're gonna go over all the keyboard functionalities. Um, another thing you can note is that the keyboard feels pretty dang good. When I was typing on it for a more budgety keyboard, it feels pretty good. It's a membrane keyboard. It's nothing too special. Uh, it's still more of a budgety keyboard, I think. And at fifteen hundred dollars, I kind of wish it had a better keyboard, but I think this is gonna suffice for most people. And you're gonna be able to type on this pretty well now. The touchpad here is a smaller than average touchpad. That is one downside. Um, and I believe this is a plastic touchpad. So something like the Zephyrus G16 has a glass touchpad. You still get a plastic touchpad on this guy. And it did work fine for me when I was using it um, to set up windows and everything. Um, and it doesn't feel too bad. It's just smaller. So you don't have quite as much wiggle room, um, you know, and... Uh, to move your fingers around or to do bigger three or four finger gestures, you're going to have to be a little more precise with it because you're going to run into the edge a little bit more often. Um, you can also see that uh, because this is a 16 by, uh, let's see if I can get the camera to focus, there we go. You can see that we've got a 16 by 9 aspect ratio display, and that does mean that we have a bit more of a bottom chin to this laptop, all right? So, uh, compare that to like the Zephyrus G16, where you don't have the bottom chin because it's a 16 by 10 display. That's a very important aspect of buying this laptop. You're you're giving up certain things to get a nicer display in a cheaper price point. Um, essentially, that's the trade-offs you're deciding to make when you're getting this laptop. Now, um, going around the laptop, you can see the ports. Now, notice that this this port. See if I can get the. So notice that that port right there uh, is a black port versus a blue port. And that is probably only a USB 2.0. I can go ahead and check. Let's go ahead and pop over the tech specs. We do indeed only have one USB 2.0. The other two USBs are 3.2 Gen 1s. So that's nice. And we do have a USB type C, but note that it is not a Thunderbolt 4, okay? So that's important to note. This is not, a number, not, not Thunderbolt 4, but the HDMI is a 2.1, which is really nice to see. And we have Intel Wi-Fi 6, not Wi-Fi 6E, and it's Bluetooth 5.2. So there's another couple trade-offs right there, all right? 90 watt-hour battery, at least according to this. We're going to double-check the watt-hour battery when we actually open the bottom of the laptop up. Okay, so we have one slower USB-A. One fast 3.2 Gen 1, 
On the rear of the device, we have no ports. It's just two fan exhausts. We also have another big fan exhaust over here on the right, okay? So it's you can see it's a double-sided fan exhaust. Um, and then on the right side, we have a headset port, USB-A 3.2, and a USB-C 3.2, and then an HDMI 2.1, and a upward-facing Ethernet port, so you can easily take un unplug and replug the Ethernet port. I love that. Um, okay, and I'm not sure if this logo lights up or anything special. It does have a plastic cover on it. I'm guessing it does not have RGB lighting. So uh, flipping it upside down now so you can see the bottom. We've got this nice crisscross pattern. I think this looks actually kind of cool. Um, we do have a number of air intakes, like air intake, air intake, air intake, air intake, air intake. Uh, like some of these are air intakes and some of them are not. And you can't really tell unless I flip it upwards. And now you can tell when you look inside there. So you can see those copper heat pipes for the high power components on the inside. So it's kind of a nice touch that you can see inside the laptop um, like that. Let's go ahead and grab the toolkit and start taking this guy apart. Four screws along the top and notice that this is just Phillip head screws, okay? But you are gonna want a magnetic head on your screwdriver. And there is a factory warranty sticker thing here. Okay, so notice that some of these, it's very important to note that some of these screws are small little screws, okay? And if you were to try to put this big screw through the small little screw hole, and then you were to force it, you'll literally like drill a hole through your chassis or motherboard. So uh, you're gonna wanna be careful not to accidentally <laughs> Put the screw in the wrong way or in the wrong hole you know into the am got this shirt from into the am they've got a lot of cool and colorful shirts um and there's a link in the description down below if you want to check them out all right so i got the back up you really probably want to start with the back and then you go all the way around from one side to keep going around this is i i'm pretty sure this is different internals than the katana 15. interesting Okay, so we've got a 90 watt hour battery along the bottom here. Let me zoom in a little more. So we've got a 90 watt hour battery. We've got speakers on the left and right side, downward firing. We've got a Micron one terabyte SSD. And there is also, uh, there is also some thermal padding underneath the SSD. We got the battery connector right here. If you need to, if you want to test, uh, uh, change stuff out on the motherboard, you would want to change that here. Um, one thing that I am noticing is that the M.2 slot, there is an M.2 on the board here, but because of this battery being where it is, there's going to be no way to upgrade to that slot. So basically the battery would have to be shorter if you wanted to upgrade the M.2 slot here. So we've got SK Hynix DDR5-5600. 1RX16. So it is 5600 memory and it's going to be two 8 gig sticks. And then let's check out the Wi Fi module. One thing that's definitely disappointing to me is that we don't have a second M.2 slot, um, at least out of the gate here. All right, so we have an Intel AX201 for our Wi Fi module here. And we got our little antenna plugins right here. Those look like nice and securely connected. Overall upgradability on this is pretty minimal. You obviously have your two sodium slots. They're easy to access. I like that part. Um, if you're gonna wanna upgrade the SSD size though, you're gonna have to actually, uh, we'll have to see how the actual performance goes though. It's interesting that, that uh, MSI claims only 5,200 mega transfers on the RAM and yet it is 5,600 rank uh, our speed RAM. So interesting that they're choosing to down clock the RAM speed. Uh, you can see we've got this big metal pads. This is gonna go over the VRMs on the GPU. The CPU has a dedicated heat pipe right here. Notice that we got this other heat pipe right here. This heat pipe is gonna connect to the other heat pipes and ensure that basically heat is being transferred out through these other heat pipes, right? So it's kind of like a heat transfer heat pipe, which is an interesting design. We've got four shared heat pipes. 
between the CPU and GPU. I mean, essentially this fifth heat pipe is like another shared heat pipe because it does affect the CPU VRMs over here. Um, and essentially what that's gonna do is if, as, if you're doing a CPU only load, you're gonna have all four of these being shared. And then this one would transfer heat from the VRMs over to these other pipes as well. Um, it's an interesting thermal design. We've got a little bit smaller fan on the, the this side over here and a bigger fan over here on the right side. Um, and notice that there is a dual exhaust over here on the right side and only a single fan exhaust on the left. So that's gonna kind of reduce the thermal capability of the machine, not having four fan exhausts. Um, and I gotta say the port selection on this laptop is also pretty minimal. And I really wish there was a Thunderbolt 4 port uh, instead of USB-C, but I guess they wanted to save some money on that front. The other thing is I really wish there was a second M.2 slot because I know some people are gonna really want to have uh, the second slot to put another M.2 in. Anyway, so that's the internals. Here is the Katana 15, and you can see how similar our thermal design is as well as the motherboard design. You can see that we have the M.2 slot like kind of semi open over here. It's not quite actually open. There's no place to mount uh, an M.2 inside of here. It's the same situation, but you get a smaller battery on the Katana. The thermal solution looks essentially identical, almost identical, not quite like, I guess some of these pipes are shared a little bit differently between these, um, between here. You can see there's like, yeah, the way that the way the pipes are laid out is a little bit different. The battery size, on the Pulse 15 is quite a bit bigger as well. So there's there's quite a few differences between the Katana and the Pulse, but it, you can tell it's like a slightly, very, uh, slightly changed up version of it. It's almost the same exact laptop um, on the internals, just a little bit different. Okay, so, all right, so let's go ahead and turn the system on. So you can see it flashed yellow, and then the backlight comes on, and that backlight looks pretty dang good. I think the backlight looks better than most. It's got a four zone RGB backlight. Uh, and by default, it does this like rainbow wave pattern that I think looks pretty dang good. Let me go ahead and turn my lights off so you can see the backlight a little better. We'll go over the keyboard functionality. So there's the keyboard. Um, and I gotta say, you know, the keyboard does feel pretty good for a budgety keyboard. Um, I think that the if you're the keyboard has good functionality except the number pad i think is scrunched in a bit you know ideally you want the number pad to be more full size and to have the standard layout so you can inherently type automatically you'll have to relearn a little bit of your uh keyboard memory if you're used to a normal number pad uh, but at least the the seven eight nine these numbers are similarly spaced to how they normally are the enter key being so low may be very odd for some people though um, the WASD keys, so let's focus on the actual key functionalities here. The WASD, are, they are clear translucent keys and they do light up to be much more colorful than the other keys like the E and F key. Um, if we look at the top, uh, you can see the extra functionality. We have, volume, we have mute, volume, volume down, up, turn trackpad off, mic mute, um, webcam enable, disable, backlight key button. I'm not sure what the F7 does. I think that's the MSI center, actually. Let me see. F7. Oh, that's your fan profile button. Okay, so um, let me show you. So if you press F7, if you do FN plus F7, then you can change between the different fan profiles without having to open the MSI center. So you've got balance mode, silent mode, battery mode, and then AI mode, and then extreme performance mode. So that's kind of cool. I actually didn't know that that was the key for that. So moving along the top here, you've got your F8 key being your keyboard backlight brightness. So you can change how bright the keyboard is. And then you have your display brightness down and up. And then you have your external monitor button all right, and going over to the number pad area. So we have our multiplication, divide, plus, minus, num lock button with an extra light up illumination. We've got 
the, the numbers obviously, the enter key being on the bottom right, another enter key here, so you can use either one. Uh, and then our arrow keys have some special functionalities as well. In addition to being their own unique design with more translucent up and down portions, you can hold the FN, pause, play, turn on crosshair, turn off crosshair, enable max fan mode is the up arrow button, and then disable display, I believe, or maybe log out. Yeah, that's the, I pressed it and the screen went black, pressed it again and nothing's coming back. <laughs> I don't know if that's the, put the device to sleep, maybe. That might also be device sleep button. Okay, so there's the display. Uh, I'm guessing, I don't know. All right, so while we have all the lights turned off, let's go ahead and do our screen backlight test. All right, so I have, uh, we definitely have some noticeable backlight bleed in the top left of my unit. Just about everywhere else though is just about perfect. Very minimal backlight bleed in the left and right corners just a little in the top right, but mainly right here and right here, we have a, a bit of backlight bleed. That might be a little noticeable in certain situations. Of course, backlight bleed is gonna vary from unit to unit, so it's gonna, you can't really rely on it. Um, all right, so as always, I'd give you the, the caveat of um, my Spider 5 Elite that I have here is not as color, um, it usually underestimates the color gamut on laptop displays that I test them compared to what other testing tools uh, from other you know other reviewers use, and so know that this is probably an underestimation of the actual display quality. So we got 100% of an sRGB coverage, phenomenal. 91% of Adobe RGB and 88% of the P3 color gamut. That's excellent for a $1,500 laptop. That's pretty rare to see this level of color gamut, uh, usually you don't get that colorful of a display. Now, going into the brightness, we got 16.9 nits on the low end with 16,850 to one on the contrast ratio. Uh, obviously, the contrast ratio on the low end doesn't really matter that much. What matters is the brightness as you go to the, to the, to the peak, and we got 336.8 nits brightness, so 337 with 790 to one contrast ratio. Now the contrast ratio could definitely be a bit better. Um, at 790 to one, I would think that we would actually get a little bit better um, contrast ratio. I, I would hope we would have a better contrast ratio, but we didn't. Anyway, 790 is still okay-ish. We've seen some laptops with lower 600s or 700s, so this is still better than some, but I prefer over a thousand. Um, it gives the, gives the image on the laptop a more punchy feel. And obviously the higher the contrast, the better. So, you know, many LEDs have like a million, like a thousand, a hundred thousand to one. Um, okay, so anyway, overall, the display quality, phenomenal. For a $1,500 laptop, this is great, all right? This is, this is very, very good. Um, obviously, it doesn't get much more colorful at 88% of the P3, 91% of the Adobe RGB when factoring in my uh, my testing tool, this is close to 100% Adobe and P3 color gamut coverage. That's phenomenal. And then the brightness and contrast, it's 337 nits. That's beyond the 300 nit uh, minimum that I, or not minimum, but ideal minimum. 300 nits is kind of the entry level to where you're getting into the more premium displays. and. And to, to, to me, like if you're in brighter environments, you really wanna get 300 nits. So this being 337 nits is, is great. Like it's not as good as the best displays. The best displays this year are like a thousand nits in the mini LEDs. But you're gonna have to go to like 3000 bucks typically to get most mini LED laptops, maybe even four or $5,000 for the more expensive ones. So um, this is very competitive with a lot of laptop displays in the $2,000 to $3,000 range, and even has more colorful than many laptops in the $3,000 range. To, uh, cooler boost enabled. So there's the fan starting to go at maximum. So this is the MSI Center. This lets you select your fan profile, and this laptop does have a MUX switch, which means that you can bypass the integrated graphics to get better GPU performance by running on discrete graphics mode only. So we're gonna be testing today in discrete graphics mode only. And we're all gonna be on extreme performance with Cooler Booster on, which means we're gonna have maximum fans. Now inside of here, you can also set your own custom 
fan profiles if you want to balance your fan noise with your performance. You also have GPU overclocking baked into the MSI center, um, but it's not very detailed overclocking and, you, and it limits you on how far you can overclock. So I would usually overclock with MSI afterburner. Here is where you can s turn on and off a number of extra things. Like you can disable the webcam if you don't want the webcam on. Um, display overdrive, which increases the response rate of the display. You've got your GPU switch here, but we can do that in the performance mode as well. You also have the crosshair you can turn off and on. Uh, and you can also change the settings on the crosshair if you want to move it a little bit left and right and also change the color of it. So let's see if we can get the crosshair to appear real quick. I'm not seeing the crosshair come up. Oh, there it is. Okay. So that's what the crosshair looks like. You can change the color to be different colors and um, you can reset the location as well. So we can turn it off and on with the hot key, the FN plus down arrow or um, enable, disable it basically. So uh, we can also enable or disable the windows key and the FN. You can switch the FN and windows key to be in different spots if you're not used to that. Um, or if you just want the FN to be on the left side. You can make it make it do that and then you can also change the functionality of the power button to make it go to sleep or hibernate when you press the power button um, and the usb power share button here this allows you to keep the usb port activated uh, when the uh, display or sorry when your laptop is asleep so if you want to charge your phone and not have the laptop running like say you're at the airport and your phone's dying you could plug in your phone and keep your laptop asleep and not using as much juice um, you also have HDR mode here. I don't think that is this. I don't think this is an HDR display, but let's see. Can we do HDR? So now we have HDR streaming, video streaming enabled, and I suppose we could test that real quick and just see how this display looks with the HDR video. You can see this display is awesomely colorful, and it looks it looks really good. I mean, it's hard to, it, it would be hard to complain about the colors on this display. It's just not going to be quite as bright or as contrasty as the more expensive laptop displays. Um, and yet this is still going to be very, very good. We, we, inside of here, inside of user scenario, you can deactivate the GPU. We could do integrated graphics mode. Uh, but let me, let me just do a quick test, okay? I want to test when we load the CPU what's our performance and also what's our wattage. So let me go to a not 10 minute test. All right. All right. So our wattage is 125 Watts. It was pulling 125 Watts there. Now it's saying only 44 Watts, but you got to keep in mind that HW info uh, is lagging behind when we're running process lasso. So it's not going to be as accurate of data. It's the only downside about using process lasso for my testing. Um, but process lasso basically makes the Cinebench take the priority. Very interesting that basically it went to 125 watts and then it down clocked. So right now it's starting at 4.7 on the P cores, 3.6 on the E cores. It's doing 75 watts there and now it's dropping down to only 43 watts. Look at our temperatures, only 51 degrees on the cores, 53 on the package. You know what? I think we may need to update the BIOS given this performance. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you how to update the BIOS on this guy. Uh, and it's gonna be one of the things about this laptop that you're gonna have to deal with if you're getting an MSI laptop. So we need to go to MSI's website. We're gonna go to the, the support page. We're gonna see if there's a BIOS update available. I did mean to upgrade this uh, before we did this, but I just didn't have time. And I figured it would also be a good thing for me to test bef like live. And I can show you the BIOS as well. Like if we, if we download this and the BIOS is not, uh, does not need to be upgraded, then it doesn't really matter, right? And we can just, I can just show you the BIOS and we can keep moving. Um, but either way, so what you do, if you want to upgrade the MSI BIOS, you go to their website, you go to your, your, you just search. I usually search on Google, the name of the web, uh, name of the laptop, MSI support page. I go to the page. I go to, I go to the driver section. I go to drivers and downloads and I click the BIOS 
And then here's the BIOS. You can see it was released on March 22nd. So this may already have the latest BIOS because that's not very recent. Um, and then I copied that onto a flash drive. So I got a flash drive right here. I went ahead and copied it onto it already. So now that we've done that, we can go ahead and shut down the laptop. Also, when we do this, I'm gonna go ahead and switch us to integrated graphics mode. So for our CPU test, what this does is it shuts down the discrete GPU and it, that, that in theory could allow the CPU to potentially boost to the mass, uh, to the, could potentially make the CPU have a higher power limit. Sorry, when you go into the integrated graphics mode only, that's what happened with the uh, MSI GT77 Titan. Okay, so uh, I believe it's gonna be F2, but we might have to restart a couple times as we try to figure out which button it is. I'm gonna try to get the exact button. F2. I don't think it's gonna go. It's probably something else. It's probably the delete key. All right, pressing the delete key. There we go. All right, so we're into the BIOS now. And if you're wanting to up, update the BIOS, uh, and I think we had BIOS 108. I think we're seeing 106. BIOS version is 106 from January 3rd. So yeah, we do need to update the BIOS. And right here, we're going to go down to UEFI BIOS update. All right, and we're gonna go ahead and select our, I believe it's the top one here. And then we're gonna select the BIOS file 108.108 .108 right here. You gotta make sure you select the right file here. You press okay, and then it says it's gonna open the BIOS image and update, confirm. Click yes. Okay, in BIOS updating, system will power off, then power on automatically. We're gonna press okay. And it's gonna grab the BIOS file off of the flash drive so that we can update the, the basically it's the firmware that runs the laptop. That's what the BIOS is, okay? So then we click proceed with flash update. MSI requires you to use a USB stick for this. That's a downside. You know, most, most laptops uh, these days are using like Windows update or some kind of software updating tool to, to install updated BIOSes. And MSI is still using flash drives, which there's advantages and disadvantages. Other companies are still using flash drives as well. Some of them, but most of them are still now moved to Windows Update. So it's one of the cons of this laptop. And I guess in, in some ways it's also a pro in that like with Asus laptops, maybe you didn't want the latest BIOS update to actually update. Uh, and it went ahead and did it automatically with Windows Update against your will. You know, in a sense, you know, at least with MSI, it's all manually done. So you know for sure when it happens and we are ready to launch our Cinebench R23 again. Now that we've updated the BIOS and now that we are in integrated GPU only mode. So we're gonna go to extreme performance. Uh, well, looks like the BIOS, looks like the BIOS actually reset our system so that we didn't go to integrated GPU only mode. So we're gonna re restart the system again. All right, so we're ready to test our CPU. Once again, we are in extreme performance mode. All right, with maximum fans enabled. And we're in integrated graphics only mode. So right now we're doing 4.7 gigahertz on the P cores, 3.6 on the E cores. We're doing 92, 118, 124 watts to the CPU. That is really good wattage to the CPU. Let's see if it can maintain 120 something watts the, during this whole test. We have reached thermal throttling at 97 degrees. So it's, it's pushing us all the way up to the maximum um, performance that we can get at least with the temperatures that we have in this chassis, right? Uh, and right now we're doing a 10 minute test. We are doing 4.3, 4.4 gigahertz on the P cores right now, 3.2 gigahertz on the E cores. Our performance is much better now than when before the BIOS update and when we were in dedicated GPU mode. Uh, now we're doing 90 watts of power. We're averaging 83 watts of power so far during this 10 minute test. So it looks like it like goes to about 130 watts initially. And now we're down clocking to 89 watts for our long power limit. We're no longer being thermal throttled, we're doing 89, uh, 85 degrees on the CPU package, 79 on the cores. Overall, our performance is pretty good overall. Like for a thin, thinner, lighter laptop that only weighs five pounds, 
This is very good. This is a little bit behind what the Zephyrus G16 was doing, though. The G16 with the same CPU, I believe, was pulling 100 watts or 99 watts of power. Um, so about 8 to 10 watts more. I guess 15 watts if you were to look at the averages. Um, but it, this did pull the same max wattage as the Zephyrus G16. So right now we're doing 4.3 gigahertz for our 10 minute average, 3.26 gigahertz for our E-Core average. Um, and then we got 79 degrees on the cores, 86 degrees on the package. Um, our overall average for the entire 10 minute test has been 87 watts, but we've been hitting 90 watts pretty consistently. It's just, there's a lot of lulls in Cinebench, so it goes down a little bit for our averages. Overall, this is very good CPU performance for the money. Our overall score was 15,868. That's a very good score. That's about a thousand points to Zephyrus G16 in the same price category though. And just know that it's not the very best at this price range, but it's very close to the best that you can get for the money at this price range. Let's go ahead and reboot into dedicated graphics mode. Okay, so there's our webcam. Here we are, we're talking on the webcam and it's a maximum uh, good lighting for me, but the image is pretty grainy and it's pretty noisy. Uh, and it's not that high a resolution. I believe it's only a 720p webcam. So this webcam is gonna be very bare bones. Are not that great. It'll work for a Skype call, but not much else. Beautiful. Okay, so we have Peter Spacey Roar to start out with. And I'm gonna hold the mic about 10 inches in front. All right, faded Aeon, Half-Life. Very nice. Uh, Deuce Williams, La La La. Okay, so um, let me see if there's also any audio programs to do any changes to the audio. I don't think MSI has much in the way of applications. Let's go to all apps and just see. But uh, overall, there was a little bit of bass. There could definitely be more bass. The mids and highs were there. The overall volume was not that loud. Uh, so there is Nahimic. Uh, okay, so we can adjust some settings in Nahimic here. All right, so we could turn, audio effects were on during that test. We were on music with bass, bass boost, voice boost, and treble boost enabled. So I can try playing Peter Spacey and, and activate, deactivate that. Okay, yeah, so um, you definitely want to have Nahimic on and enabled because it sounded way better. Um, that said, the speakers overall are probably like a six and a half out of 10, six out of 10. 
not really that great, kind of your average gaming laptop speakers. Uh, they could definitely be louder. They could definitely be more punchy. They could definitely have better mids and highs. So many different settings. Got to make sure they're right on this uh, test. Sweet. So I think we're ready to go ahead and do our test now. Hopefully we're getting pretty close to being matched up. And let me go and set right, press right click here to get our averages going. Um, okay, so looking at our temps, our CPU temps are 76, 86, 69, 73. So our temps on the CPU are pretty good. Our GPU is doing 90, 113 watts was the highest I saw there. Our GPU temps are really good at, at only 58, 69 now. 71, 69 is obviously not a big load, uh, not an extended load, um, but it's still something. And we're able to see at least roughly what we're able to pull. I saw 112 watts on the GPU there for at least part of it. Um, our GPU, CPU temps are obviously very good. There we go. Okay, so now we're getting all the data on the split screen there. That's better. Okay, so our temperatures are better on the Katana, which is interesting. Our wattage pull is higher on the RTX 4060 on the Pulse 15. That's an interesting thing to note. Um, and it's obviously much better. Well, this is Red Dead Redemption 2 1080p. We need to jump. This is, this is the correct lined up benchmark, okay? Because the katana was at the katana there was at 1080p resolution before. Now we're both at QHD plus 16 by 10 aspect ratio. So you can see the katana is doing 59 FPS. In the same scenario, I had to turn down the Sono sound system there. Uh, but yeah, the katana was doing around 58 so far. And I didn't have the average going for the uh, Pulse 15 during this test, but we're seeing some about five to eight FPS more on the 4070 Katana. And notice our, our GPU wattage pull being only like 85, 83, 88 on the Katana 4070. We're definitely pulling a lot more wattage with the MSI Pulse 15. That's very important to note. Um, and it's the kind of thing that is a good sign for the Pulse 15, but it's we're still nowhere near the ideal um, length of time. Interesting, our guy got stuck there for the, the, the Pulse 15. So we got 48.7 FPS with the RTX 4060. Um, and we were doing closer to like 105 watts most of the time. And we had 57 FPS with the Katana 15. So... Um, about, about an 8.5 FPS gain for the 4070 in this test, which is interesting. Resolution and frame rate. So we're going to do full screen. We're doing uh, ray tracing on ultra frame generation enabled DLSS is on quality. Everything else is on ultra. That's looking good. Um, okay. So. Our current FPS right now, wow. The Katana 15 is doing a lot higher FPS, doing 68 versus 50. All right, so big gains for the Katana. It makes me wonder if the settings were wrong or different somehow. Um, let's just focus on the CPU and GPU temperatures right now. The Katana 15 uh, doing better CPU and GPU temps, but the the GPU is pulling about 20 more watts on the Pulse 15 than the Katana in this fairly CPU GPU uh, heavy test. And the CPU is also pulling more wattage on the Pulse 15, or at least it was for parts of it. It seems like it goes up and down a little bit between the two on the CPU, but it seems like most of the time the Pulse had slightly higher CPU wattage. So let's just verify that our, all of our settings were the same. Okay, so the Katana, the Katana 15 had the setting on auto for DLSS. That's why it was faster on the FPS. So unfortunately that was not ran at the same settings. 
I wonder if I redo the test at all. I don't think that I do. If the game does it, hopefully that it'll down, down and up clock it according to its needs. All right, so let's go ahead and run it benchmark again. We're gonna run it back. We want it to be as, as similar settings as possible. I hate doing auto because it's hard. It's like kind of giving some control over just going to a computer to decide what the DLSS quality level is, but it's the best I can do. I believe it's gonna be equivalent to balanced mode. All right, so that should be very close. All right, so that should be the same settings. Now, um, we're getting a lot more comparable frame rates Very interesting. So uh, 79 FPS versus 65 FPS, that's much more realistic, all right? And our wattage pull on the GPU is still more though on the RTX 4060 and the Pulse 15. 96 watts versus 85 watts, 100, and 100 watts. We're rarely going over 100 though in this fairly CPU, GPU heavy test. Uh, the CPU, I did just see 91 degrees on the CPU on the Pulse 15. All right, so our end result, 73 FPS for the Katana 15, 60, 60.55, 60 so 61 FPS on the Pulse 15. So you get 13 more FPS going with the Katana 15, but you have the lower quality display, right? So there's your trade-off. Uh, same resolution, same settings on those two tests. Um, all right, so moving on to God of War. But okay, so you can see we're 2560, 16 by 10 is what we should go for. There we go, 2560, 16 by 10. All right, and then our graphics, we're on all ultra. Fifty five FPS versus sixty five FPS. Our overall average being sixty six thirty three versus fifty seven thirty four. So you're definitely going to get higher FPS if you go with the Katana fifteen at this price point, but not massively different FPS. Um, very similar all around. Um, performance, it's like uh, a nine FPS difference. I guess that's, that's nine FPS. What's that gonna be like a 17% performance gain? That's not nothing. That is, that is a substantial performance gain, I guess, in my opinion. Um, but not like night and day. You know, I wouldn't expect it to be night and day. 4070 to 4060 um, is gonna be, I don't know, that's a tough one to decide whether that's worth it or not, but this is gonna give us a uh, 16 by nine QHD display. So let's go ahead and do uh, Cyberpunk 2077, this time being ran just on this display. Okay, so we're on ray tracing on ultra. All right, ray tracing on ultra, DLSS to quality. I'm just gonna make sure that this sets to quality because sometimes it doesn't. All right, so uh, full screen. So now we're doing 2560 by 1440p, which is a 16 by nine aspect ratio, uh, which is about 10% less FPS, uh, which may, should make it a little bit easier to run Cyberpunk 2077. So looking at our wattage pull, I just saw 122 watts there for a moment. Uh, 140, I saw it, I saw 139, I saw 139.7. For a split screen, uh, for a split second, we did 140 watts. <laughs> uh, okay, so um, we're hitting really high GPU utilization. That's nice to see. Uh, 42 watts to the GPU, 45 watts, 130 a again for a split second. So weird that it, it cannot pull the full wattage. Even though we're hitting really high GPU utilization, we're just averaging a little bit over 100 watts probably for our GPU pull, between like 100 and 105, somewhere in that range. 58.7, so 59 FPS on all ultra settings, QHD. That is very, very good, though. Notice that our VRAM is basically being maxed out. 
Let's try hopping into the game just a little bit. I just did a side-by-side -side test with a 3070 and a 4060, both in the Zephyrus G15 and G16. Um, and the 4060 won every test I did. Uh, okay, so popping in here, we got some gameplay. We're gonna shoot some bad guys up. Uh, it's playing very smooth, very, uh, very pretty good 1% lows at 35 FPS. So it looks very smooth for this gameplay. It's obviously not super high refresh rate gameplay, but it's certainly playable. So notice that our notice that our VRAM right now is at 7.99. We are hitting the max VRAM usage on this laptop, uh, but we're not stuttering in our 1% lows or anything. So that's a good sign in a sense. All right, beautiful. So we, we defeated them. We averaged 55 FPS during that firefight. And our 1% lows really aren't too bad. It looks and plays very smooth still. This is, of course, on all ultra settings with everything max with ray tracing. If we were to instead do something like um, set everything to low with DLSS on quality. Now look at our FPS. We're doing 125 FPS uh, and obviously very good performance. So you'll have options with this GPU, even at QHD, and this is QHD resolution, right? Like it's, uh, it's not a low resolution. To be hitting 125 FPS is awesome. Now, if we turn off frame gen, then we're gonna see what we get on the raw rasterization, all low settings. Whoa, it's still 120? What? Super weird. Frame gen not giving us hardly any extra FPS in this scenario, which is super interesting. Only like 20 or 30 FPS. Um, maybe it's just inherent to this area of the game or something, but usually frame gen boosts are uh, a lot more noticeable. Or maybe the frame gen is actually not turning off for some reason in the settings, because it should go down a lot more. My guess is frame gen's not turning off. Uh, DLSS on quality, ultra quality preset, all right? Because this is a very CPU heavy game and sometimes you don't get full GPU utilization in a game like this. It's interesting that we're only getting 65 FPS in this scenario. Oh, it's because we're in QHD resolution. I was gonna say, um, I could do a five way I could show you the five-way performance comparison. The Zephyrus G16 in this scenario was doing about 85, 86 FPS. Uh, and so this is very similar performance. This is actually just a little bit higher than the Zephyrus G16. Right now we're doing 91 FPS. There's This is some great performance actually, better than the Zephyrus G16, which is kind of what you'd expect. It's supposed to be a higher wattage and it does have faster RAM. I'm guessing the faster RAM is the reason we're getting a performance boost in this scenario, because the actual GPU boost is nothing. Um, so let's jump up to QHD resolution. Let's see how we do at the higher resolution. It's gonna help us not be as CPU bound jumping up to QHD resolution. I'm guessing we will be GPU bound in this scenario. All right, so I just refreshed our FPS counter. Um, and we're gonna just walk up this hallway here and then we'll walk down the hallway coming back the other way. Now, we're obviously not getting the full 140 watts to the GPU, which is a little sad because I was hoping we would see that in this, in this laptop, but we're not. All right, so uh, we're gonna go ahead and refresh this and we're gonna walk the walk. We have a new set of benchmarks there at the top. You can see that we're doing very high GPU utilization. We're not being CPU bound in this scenario, um, but we are utilizing a high CPU wattage. So our FPS is gonna be limited as a result because our GPU is being limited down to only 85 watts approximately right now, which does not let us boost to the full GPU potential. But at least at QHD resolution, we're still gonna get well above um, playable frame rates in dead space on all ultra settings. You know, so that is very nice to see. So we ended up with 70 FPS, 31 for our QHD Ultra Settings DLSS enabled on quality. Um, and looking at our temps, our temps are also very good right now, right? They're not bad. 
they are pretty dang good. I'm just going to double check. We are in extreme performance mode. Cooler boost is enabled. Okay, just wanted to make sure we were good there, and we are. Um, we've been on the right settings. Okay, so overall, you should be able to play Dead Space, no problem. Let's move on to Dying Light 2. Beautiful. So we're at QHD, 16 by 9. DLSS on quality, frame generation is enabled. We're gonna go ahead and run this benchmark. So Baka says, uh, better TDP 4060, better than a lower TDP 4070. Um, we don't know that yet, Baka, but maybe, depending on how low the 4070 TDP is. Uh, like if it's a medium 4070 TDP, it'll probably be equal to a high TDP 4060. Um, but it all depends on, I don't, I'm not sure at what TDP levels the 4060 passes the 4070. It will pass it at a certain level. Like if it's a 45 watt or 60 watt 4070, then this 100, um, 105 watt, 107, 110 watt, this might beat a 60 watt 4070 or less. But if it's, if it's a, at least 75, 80, 90, 100 watt 4070, it's probably still going to beat 140 watt 4060, I think. But we actually got to do the tests to find out. Like, that's probably around the ballparks if I were to be guessing off the top. Laro says, hey, Gizmo, for 1080p editing, do you think there would be an improvement from a 4060 to a 4080? Uh, thanks in advance. Yes. A 4080 is going to have uh, twice as many video encoder boosters chips in the GPU. So... You're going to get more GP, uh, more video editing power out of a 4080 and a 4090. There's basically like twice as many. Uh, right at 4950 FPS for QHD. And the, the default dying light counter said 48. Interesting. I don't know if this counted correctly or not. Because usually, yeah, it, frame generation was off during that test. I was going to say it should be higher than that. Um, frame generation was off. I'm going to save this. I'm going to click yes. I'm going to just double check. We'll try to benchmark one more time. If this doesn't work, I'm going to restart the game with frame generation enabled. And then hopefully it'll activate. This may be the same thing as Cyberpunk 2077 where frame generation doesn't want to turn off unless you restart the game or turn on if you, unless you restart it. So, and I've had this bug happen in Dying Light 2 before. So I think we should be able to get noticeably higher FPS than 54. So we're gonna restart the game. Frame generation said it was still off. Let's try restarting the game. It doesn't wanna turn on right now. Frame generation is on now. Okay, so now we can see the difference between frame generation being enabled and disabled. We got 50 FPS last time. Hopefully this time, it will render correctly and we can get our accurate FPS. Okay, so we were doing around 50 FPS before. Now we're doing 75 FPS with frame generation finally turning on. Um, so this is around a 50% bump to performance, at least initially. We'll see um, as we continue through the test, I'm guessing it's gonna continue to go down a little bit. So it might only be like a 40% bump or 35% bump to performance, but um, Frame generation is obviously going to help us uh, boost our performance or in smoothness. It's going to boost the smoothness of the gameplay pretty noticeably. All right, so we ended up with 73 FPS, 36 for our 1% low. The, 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 that 1% low doesn't really matter that much. Um, and notice now that our number is a lot different from the, the number that Afterburner counted was basically double that of what the, um, what the game counter counted. But 73 FPS in Dying Light 2 at QHD resolution, all ultra settings with ray tracing enabled. Of course, frame generation also being enabled. Um, extremely playable, smooth frame rate. Um, good experience all around. Let's check out God of War with QHD resolution instead of 16 by, by 9. Smoothness. Um, in the gameplay. It was a huge difference when you have frame generation in those games. So uh, see this test at 16 by nine aspect ratio now, instead of 16 by 10, I believe we saw, what was it? 55 FPS at 16 by 10. So jumping down to 16 by nine, now we're doing 59 so far in this little run through test. 
So 61 and 30 for our 1% lows. This is obviously a very playable, good gaming experience. I like to see it. Um, we've got all ultra settings with textures on low because of VRAM limitations. Uh, and we'll see, I believe we're gonna run out of VRAM at QHD resolution. I don't know if we'll run into VRAM stuttering necessarily. Um, we definitely would if we had textures on ultra. So here we are, we're in Hogsmeade. We are in one of the most demanding areas of the Hogwarts legacy video game. Lots and lots of NPCs through here, which causes 1% low stutters, and then a very complex texture set. We're utilizing the maximum VRAM right now in the GPU uh, at, I mean, it says seven gigs, but there's basically like a buffer wiggle room um, where it'll fill up before we actually use everything. But notice that our 1% low is not too terrible. 23 is not great but we're not stuttering all the time. It looks pretty smooth from a gameplay perspective right now. I'll let you know if I see any other big stutters, visually speaking, and you'll probably be able to see them as well. The key thing to know is that with an RTX 3000 series, even a 3080 is gonna struggle here on these settings that we're currently on. Just know that, let's go ahead and do a run through. We're gonna run through to the end of Hogsmeade and see what our average is for our official run through test here. Right now doing 64 FPS, 31 for our 1% lows. Let's see what we get at the end. Again, not running into any texturing issues uh, or VRAM limitation issues. As far as I can tell, everything is looking good. The quality of everything, the textures on everything is, is good for the low settings that we're at. Our Actual wattage pull on the GPU CPU, again, very CPU heavy area of the game, 52 watts, 45 to 50 something watts, 84, 85 uh, GPU watts, quick jump up to 115, 82, 85. So yeah, we're, we're not maxing out our GPU wattage. We're not, we're not even fully utilizing the GPU because we're very CPU bound in this area of the game still. Um, even at QHD resolution, we're still CPU bound somewhat because of the complex nature of this area of the game. So overall though, this is gonna be a very playable experience and an enjoyable experience at QHD resolution. If you want a higher FPS experience, you could always turn off ray tracing and set settings to like a medium or low settings to boost your FPS up to the 100 FPS range. Um, so there's a lot of variability inside of Hogwarts Legacy that you can take advantage of. Let's pop into Last of Us and see how we do in Last of Us. We are wanting to go on ultra settings. Notice that we cannot do ultra settings because our, our, our VRAM is limited to only eight gigs right here. It's, it's wanting 11 and a half gigs of VRAM. So we're gonna have to go down to textures here and drop everything down to medium. So medium textures, now it wants just a little bit more VRAM than what we have. Let's go ahead and do a, let's go ahead and play the game and see if we run into any issues. You could obviously drop it to low to drop the, the VRAM requirements even lower, but this is, this is another example of a game where VRAM is going to limit you if you're on an RTX 4050. I'm not sure exactly how it would play uh, yet, but I, I actually kind of want to test this game on the 4050. All right, and notice that our regular RAM is being maxed at 15.5. Our VRAM is pulling 6.9, so we're not we're not quite pulling the max, but basically pulling the max. Our FPS averages are looking pretty good, and the graphics here are phenomenal. Um, but our we're right now we're at the bottom barrel of playability, right? Like you could play the game as long as your 1% lows are at least 30 and your averages are in like the 45 range, the game is going to look and play pretty good. All right. But right now we are also on ultra settings, right? And I mean, this looks gorgeous. Like the, the, the graphics look amazing in this game on ultra settings. Um, and you could, and you could definitely enjoy the gameplay of this game as long as you're at least hitting these bare bones. The problem is, the problem is, okay, if you're hitting this close to the playable barrier, 
like dropping dropping below 30 is very likely in more demanding areas of the game. It's much better to be well above 60. Um, you know, like you, it's much better to be hitting like, oh, 70s, 80s, 90s, because that way when you get to the demanding center sections of the game, you're at least still getting like 60 plus. Um, and then in the majority of the game, you're obviously going to be much higher than that. So I'm not sure if it's going to get better than what we're at. Or if that was just a very demanding section of the game, right now our FPS average is 38, with our 1% low being 28. You know, movies are typically 24 FPS. So if, you're, if your 1% low is higher than 24, at least it'll be as smooth as a movie. For slower paced games, it's all right. It's not great for fast, twitchy type games. That's for sure. So, and that was a cinematic, right? Cinematics sometimes are higher FPS pulls than the actual um, gameplay. So when you actually get to gameplay, it might be better. So let's see what we're like um, now that we are uh, in the actual gameplay. Because cinematics sometimes, like, they, they turn up the, the, the shaders and the shadows and raster post, post settings to be even worse. And then, and then sometimes the gameplay is better. But sometimes it's the opposite, too. Sometimes it's even worse. So right now, I'm actually playing the game and... We're going from 30 something up to 40. Our 1% low is still saying 28 though. If we were to set everything to low, what would our FPS be? Can we get to a really optimal frame rate that's like above 60? And what does it take to get there? Let's find out. So if we set everything to low, all right. So if we're on, everything's on low now. And wow, okay, our FPS jumped up bigly. Our FPS went way up. I hate the word bigly. <laughs> anyway, so we're now we're in 80. So this is a lot better. So at least at least you can know that with Last of Us, if you turn it to low, you can still get very playable frame rates, um, even on QHD resolution. I like to see that we at least can hit playable. So there's going to be some somewhere in those medium to high settings is probably where you would end up playing this game at. Um, let's go ahead and just jump over to the default. There is, oh, here we are. Let's try turning on DLSS to quality mode. Okay, that helps. Now look at our FPS, holy schmoly. Now I bet we can run on ultra settings. Let's see, um, let's go to graphics, ultra, textures. Okay, now we're hitting ultra settings with 64 FPS. Now we're in business, all right? You just gotta turn, you just gotta turn the settings down. Let's try, I'm gonna try loading to a further part in the game. These are medium textures. They, it's not like it looks awful, you know? It still looks like pretty decent graphics, like better graphics than most games have, okay? On medium textures. Like that's my, that's my take on it. Okay, so I just refreshed the FPS counter. Let's see what we have. So we're running through this like downtown environment. Um, I know you can't see the, there's a bunch of buildings near me, but there was a bunch of buildings, uh, at least when I walked into this area. And I, fight, I fought and killed a bunch of zombies in here. And at least in this area as well, we're getting over 60 FPS. Like I, yeah, I, I, would, say, I would say medium's at least okay. It's, it's above average graphical quality compared to most games. Obviously, high is better, and ultra is even best, even really, really good. I mean, when you look at these textures, you can see the textures right here. Let me see if I can get the camera to expose correctly. You can see the details on the textures. They're still uh, fairly well textured on medium right now. So yeah, Last of Us is going to be playable on this laptop at QHD resolution. That was the key thing I wanted to find out, right? So let's go check out Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Let's get through our last benchmarks. So um, 165 hertz, QHD... Ray tracing on ultra, highest possible settings. Let's hop into the game. This is um, obviously a very demanding game. We're at QHD resolution. So our goal here is we want at least 60 plus FPS. The ideal FPS range for this game is probably more like 90 because there is some action elements to this game where you're aiming bows and shooting guns and stuff. So 90 to me would be the more ideal FPS range. But of course, uh, we do have ray tracing on. We have, we're at QHD resolution with DLSS on quality. So um, we'll have to see what we get. 
you know, some of the RTX 4090s in this game got like 150 to 160 FPS range. 170, I think, was like the highest. Um, and that really shows you the power difference between an RTX 4060 and a 4090. Because right now, a 4090 is doing like 100 FPS more. <laughs> it's like such a big difference. It's not that this isn't playable. This is going to be playable, I think, but still. Um, okay, Rawl says, low looks bad, medium high looks good. It's very zoomed in. Have you tried Dying Light 2 1440p? Yeah, we did that already, Rawl. Um, and we got, I think, 70-something, 80-something uh, for 1440p. Um, okay, uh, Walid uh, says... 3070 Ti, $2,000, good price. Not really, unless it's just an amazing laptop in every other way, like super high-end premium. But even uh, even a Blade, Razer Blade laptop is like 1800 right now for a 3080. So, yeah. Um, Chicken says, actually currently testing out a Legion 5 3070 Ti. I grabbed it off eBay for 1200 That's a pretty good deal. I'm guessing it was used. Um, since you got it off eBay. Um, but yeah, buying, buying used, like light, buying, buying a lightly used laptop is probably the best way to get a bang for the buck, but it comes with big risks in the sense that you don't have a warranty. Usually oftentimes there's no warranty and you don't know what the, you don't know what the user had done to it before that, or maybe they're selling it because there's a specific problem with it. So it's always risky when you buy used unless you really trust the person that you're buying it from. Um, looking at our, our CPU temps are great. Our GPU temps are great. We're getting good GPU utilization, but again, we're only pulling 100 watts of power through the GPU during this test. So I would not call this 140 watt. I would call this like a 105 watt or maybe a 100 watt system. We ended up with 83 FPS, which is pretty dang close to the ideal FPS range that I was talking about for this laptop, uh, for this um, game in terms of gameplay quality. So graphics is going to be on Ray Tracing Ultra, DLSS set to quality. Our, D, uh, our game will be not unlimited, but frame generation, we're going to turn that on. I turned off frame generation. And yeah, now we're dipping down to 33. So if you wanted to play this without frame gen, it's not gonna be a very good experience at only 33 with 25 for our 1% lows. I mean, you could play it, but it doesn't look that smooth. Um, if we pop on frame gen, see now this feels so much smoother, but it's still, I would say I would still want a little more FPS ideally when playing Witcher 3. But we're gonna still test it like we we have the settings set up right now. Obviously, it'd be very easy to push the FPS in this just by turning off ray tracing alone. Everything else could be the same. All right, so here we are with our test. Let's see what we get. So right now we're averaging 56 with 33 FPS for our 1% lows. Uh, this is obviously very smooth gameplay. It's not bad by any means, but if I was playing The Witcher 3, I don't know. I, this is a game where, again, I'd probably shoot for more like 90 FPS as my playable target. So if this was me, I would probably go like, boom. So we ended up with 50, like 58, 28. Let's go to here. Let's just turn off ray tracing. So we just use the regular shadows instead of, so this is basically ultra settings. It may not look quite as good anymore, but look at our averages. Now we're shooting into the 85 simply by turning off ray tracing. Um, and our 1% low is now 55, which is such a smoother gameplay experience. Uh, this is so, this is so much better. So this is how I would play this game probably. And that's just another example of how you can totally get incredible gameplay gains with the RTX 4000 series, taking a game that wasn't playable and making it super playable.
Right now we are in QHD. We're gonna turn off our NVIDIA reflex and so we're set on very high settings right now. All right. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and just do our, oh, hold on. Okay, beautiful. All right, so I went ahead and refreshed the FPS counter at this point. And I gotta say this feels really good, but our FPS is not um, not high enough to max the screen refresh rate at these high settings. So it doesn't feel as good as it would if we were at a higher frame rate. So let's go ahead and set everything to low now. All right, so now it's gonna target the 165 FPS cap of our display. Um, Cause we have, we didn't, we didn't take off our FPS cap. Okay, so our low settings right now so looking at, looking at our temperatures, we're averaging around 70 to 80 degrees on the CPU, 72 on the GPU. Um, that's pretty good. We're getting 107 watts to the GPU, 105, so around 105. Let's go ahead and just do a little more of this. I'm gonna go ahead and reset my average so we can get an FPS average. So basically right now with this, with this GPU and CPU combo, we're able to do QHD Apex Legends, with no problem hitting basically our max FPS with our 1% lows also being 150. So that is superb and makes this a very good Apex Legends gaming laptop experience. So starting out, we get 66 FPS, 62. Looking at our GPU wattage levels, we're doing 103, 105. Once again, we're not hitting the 140. Uh, 140 GPU, uh, max GPU claimant, uh, which is not great. I, I really wish we were. Our CPU is only pulling 125 watts of power, which is, you know, not that much. And yet we're still only getting 106 watts to the GPU. I wonder if we went, if we go to balanced mode, if we could get higher GPU performance levels. I'm not sure. I think I'm gonna try testing balanced mode and seeing what happens. So our temperatures are really good. 65 degrees on the CPU, 66 on the GPU. We've had very good temperatures in this laptop the whole time we've had tests. There we're seeing 100 and nine, basically 109.7 watts, so 110 watts pretty much, um, to the GPU. That's one of the highest s amounts we've seen in a, in a more sustained manner. Um, again, about 110 watts again there for a little bit. A little bit sad that we're not, there's 120. <laughs> we saw 120 for a second, 110. So 110 watts, it might be a fair description of this GPU if it can actually do that more consistently. Here in the CPU test, doing 95, 98 watts for a second there, 97, 93. Nice to see some really high CPU wattages for that Cinebench or the, the, that Time Spy CPU test. Um, okay, so we got, all right, so we got 10,396 with a CPU score of 12,622. So this is obviously a very good graphic score at 10,396. Um, it's not gonna be, it's not gonna be killing like RTX 3070 Ti's that are all on the high power limit side. You gotta remember the power limit on this laptop is only about 105, 110. Um, so you gotta compare, you gotta compare apples to apples performance and really be looking for comparing this laptop against other laptops that have around the 105, 110 watt power limit for the 3070, 3070 Ti or 3060s, right? Because you gotta look to do apples to apples on the comparison. So MSI Center is not interested in loading right now. All right, so we're gonna go to balanced mode. We were in extreme performance. 
Let's try balanced mode. If I do this, okay, so I have I have maximum fans on with balance mode enabled right now. Let's see what happens when we test it like this. This will be a nice little experiment to see performance difference. So balanced mode, we are still seeing only 103 watts, 102 watts. So good to know that balanced mode's not doing anything different. Let me try cycling into, so I've turned, I've turned off of the fans. Max fans is turned off. Let's try um, quiet mode. Let's see what we get for our TDP. I don't know if it's gonna actually change our TDP mid render. We're not, I'm not gonna worry about testing it. Um, I think we got enough data on this to get a better idea of performance. So let's go ahead and just do a rigidity test. So starting in the right side, very rigid, basically no flex all the way through, a little bit of bend over here, no flex, a bit of bendy up at the top up here, no flex, a bit of bendy over here, going to the middle, we got some bend, going through the keyboard, of course we have some bend, but I would say this is um, not as bendy as what some of the other laptops out there are. Um, so overall, I do like the feel of this laptop in your hand and it's only weighs uh, five pounds and it's fairly thin. So it's not too thick. It's not too thin either. It's not a super thin one. It's like a medium size in terms of its overall thickness and, and portability. Here is the MSI Pulse 15. This laptop has got uh, a lot of potential to it. And it's, and it's, I don't think it's a bad choice. I think it's a good laptop for the money uh, at $14.99. I hope it does go on sale though, because at, I think at around, at around $13.50 to $13.99, it becomes a very, very good buy. At around $1,300 to $1,250, it would be excellent. It'd be a phenomenal buy at, at that price range. But at $1,500 at, at $1,499, at $1, it's just a... It's one of the few laptops with RTX 4000 series that has a high quality display at the $1,500 price point. The display hit 338 nits brightness and did close to 100% Adobe NP3 color gamut uh, and 100% of sRGB. It was a phenomenal display. It was great to game on. It looks good. It has a good amount of brightness um, and... I, I, no ghosting in Apex Legends. It was very responsive. It's going to be great for esports gamers, though not quite as good as a 240 hertz display. Now, the QHD nature of it will allow you to see really good details. Now, you're not going to really see that upgraded resolution in most games necessarily because uh, full HD on a 15.6 inch display is not that different than QHD unless you have very good eyesight. Now, on larger just laptop displays, going to QHD makes a bigger difference. Um, if you sit close to the laptop, it also will make a big difference. Now, in terms of CPU performance, our Cinebench R23 did about uh, 15.9 thousand in Cinebench R23, which is very good. And we had good GPU CPU performance. We got, I think about 90 watts uh, pull on Cinebench R23 for our long power limits. We have a lot of power going to the CPU, which I love to see that. Um, now in our GPU, we were only getting about 105, maybe 110 watts as our highest sustained wattage that I saw for more than a few seconds. We had occasional blips up to the 140 watts on the, the GPU, but it was like, like only for less than a second going up to 140 watts. So to me, this laptop is only a 110 watt GPU. It is not a 140 watt, and I don't think uh, I don't think you're going to be able to compare performance of this 4060 versus other thicker 140 watt, true 140 watt 4060s. Like I think there will be true 140 watt 4060s out there uh, that we will see eventually. I think as we do more testing, we'll find out. Maybe all 4060s don't go to 140 watts. Um, I'm seeing some reports in chat saying that even the Strix G16 maxes out at 120 watts. So I don't know. We'll have to find out. Now, this thing clearly can play QHD games, no problem, except for games that are highly 
texture demanding. We saw Hogwarts having to turn down our textures. And in Last of Us Part 1, we also had to turn down our textures down to medium. Now, uh, the games still look and play pretty well, but it is a visual difference, especially if you're someone who wants to play at higher texture settings, then you're going to need to get a laptop with more VRAM. And if for a 4000 series, that means going all the way up to an RTX 4080 or 4090, or going with a higher VRAM RTX 3000 series like the RTX 3080. So if you want something with higher VRAM, right now the SCAR 15 has an RTX 3080 with 16 gigs of VRAM, which is going to be more future-proof for VRAM limitations and have more overall GPU power than this laptop for raw power, but it doesn't have frame gen. So that's like a trade-off you're having to make. And it's also not as nice of a display on that SCAR 15 for 1500. Now I talked about that SCAR 15 at the beginning when I was comparing this laptop versus the other laptops. Is this laptop the very best laptop under 1500? I don't think so. I think it's a good choice at under 1500 and it's very competitive but I would actually probably be looking to pick this thing up when it goes on sale. Now, if you're looking for, if you're someone who just focuses mainly on display quality, this is one of the best display qualities for under 1500 that you can buy. So if, if you're someone who's like very display quality, like centric, centric uh, then this is gonna be a good buy. Not necessarily the very best buy all around, but for someone who's very display sensitive, this is gonna be a very good buy. We didn't have necessarily the best contrast ratio. That was the only weakest area of the display, but this was still a very good display. Bright enough, colorful enough to be very good for a video editor on a budget or, or whatever. And it's enough CPU power to do video editing on a budget as well. The keyboard on this I thought was pretty dang good for the money, not necessarily the best, not necessarily the worst. Uh, it's a nice middle ground where you're getting a decent keyboard with a good enough layout with a number pad. If you want a number pad, I like it overall. And it has a good feel and it has nice backlight, backlighting. Everything is backlit, including the secondary key functions. Uh, and I was able to type on it, no problem. Um, the touchpad, on the other hand, is a little bit smaller than I would ideally love. If you're a big touchpad user, use the touchpad a lot, you might want to look at other laptops like the Zephyrus G16, which I've also reviewed, that has a much better touchpad than this laptop. Uh, this is a plastic touchpad, and it's also smaller in size. The webcam is also not that high quality. It's one of the lowest quality webcams that you can get in a gaming laptop. Like, it's... 720p grainy and not that high of uh, color gamut and, and colors and details. It was not a very good webcam. Um, in terms of ports, the ports on this guy, we've got three USB A's, but one of those USB A's is a USB 2.0, which is going to be the kind of port you'd plug a mouse or keyboard into. Um, but uh, that's a big downside. In addition, we don't have a Thunderbolt 4 port on the USB-C. This is only a USB-C 3.2, which is not gonna be as good as a Thunderbolt 4. Uh, say you wanted to use an external GPU um, with the laptop eventually, you can't do that with this one. You could do that with a, well, a laptop that supports Thunderbolt 4, like the Acer Nitro 5 that I recently reviewed. Now, uh, overall for ports, this is pretty mediocre, but at least the HDMI is an HDMI 2.1, and the USB-C does support DisplayPort 1.4 and it's USB-C. So you do have some good display outs on this and you're gonna be able to, po uh, most people will probably be okay with the ports on this, but not for some people that need like a fast SD card reader or they wanna use an external GPU or a Thunderbolt 4 dock. That's not gonna work with this laptop. In terms of build quality, this is definitely on the like, more budgety build quality. You've got a plastic chassis for the most part. You do have a metal top lid. Um, the rigidity feels pretty good though. Like it's not too wobbly. Like it's got some nice rigidity. Um, I don't think I actually showed that. So let me quickly um, pop over to the side cam here and show you the rigidity. And battery life, you're probably looking in the three to five hours range on this. Well, actually probably a little more. I think on battery life, you're probably looking more in like the four to seven range. Um, Cause we do have a 90 watt hour battery and it's a, a much more power efficient overall system with the CPU having less cores and the display also not being as bright as some of the other ones. So depending on how you optimize it, I'm anticipating like 
like four to six for web browsing, maybe seven if you really optimize it. Um, and for your like office tasks, you're probably looking more in like the six to eight range for your just doing web, like Excel and typing in a Word document, say if you're note taking in college or something. Can I recommend this laptop at $14.99? Yes. But the primary person that wants to buy this is someone who really is focusing on the display quality over the raw performance, okay? There's gonna be thicker laptops that'll have better performance than this at the $1,499 price point. And the, like for example, the Katana 15, which we did some side-by-side -side benchmarks with today, it was definitely faster than this, like noticeably faster than this and at the same price point, but it had a way worse display, okay? If you want a nice middle ground um, of display quality and uh, performance, then I recommend the Zephyrus G16. That's a nice middle ground. If you want something that's more focused on performance and, and it's a bit thicker um, and has a, a, like a full HD display instead of QHD at around 1500, you could go with something like the Legion 5 Pro or something along those lines. In the Legion lineup, there should be some stuff in that right around that, that price range. Um, and if you're willing to go with older Gen Tech, uh, there was some deals I talked about earlier, like the Acer Nitro that has a uh, 3070 Ti and has a QHD display, and that's only 1350. So that's a better bang for the buck in terms of display and price point um, and raw power. But there's no frame gen. So if you're willing to, to, if you're if you're the kind of person who doesn't play single player games, then going for that Nitro series over this one could be a better choice. At least in the short term, that's gonna be a short term deal, right? A lot of these deals are gonna be very short term. So um, in terms of long-term pricing for the rest of 2023, at 1500, this is an okay deal. I, I would recommend it to someone who's focused on the display. At 1400, it's a good deal, a, a, a pretty good deal. And at like 1300 or 1350, it's a very good, excellent deal. That's my, that's my overall pricing evaluation of this laptop versus the competition. We'll have to see what we end up getting um, for pricing and sales. I would anticipate this thing to go on sale during Black Friday or at different um, vendors. Uh, within probably the next six to 12 months, we'll definitely see some sales on it. So if you're willing to wait and be patient, you can definitely pick this thing up for a bit less than what we're paying for it right now. So if you guys enjoyed this live stream, please hit that like button. And if you want to see more live streams in the future, hit that subscribe button with the notification bell so you can hop into the live. Uh, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Brandon out.